to our morning service. As I said last week, we're going to be um, doing a, a series on love. Today is part two of that series. Last week we did an introduction. And today we're going to begin to look at the virtues of love as found in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A very beautiful, beautiful chapter. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We want to give God thanks for his goodness and for his mercy. We want to thank him for his grace. We want to thank him for his love. He is really a wonderful God. Hallelujah. I have no regrets in serving the Lord. I'm not done so perfectly, but God was always and is always perfect in his faithfulness. Hallelujah. He's always been faithful. And I want to give him all praise, all honor, and all glory. So we want to look to the word of God. We're using two texts. 1 John 4, verse 7 and verse 8. And also 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read them both um, this morning. All right. So you are going to follow me. Hallelujah. In your Bibles, I'm reading from the King James Vir Virgin. 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Hallelujah. God is love. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, you're seeing me now, right? Praise the Lord. I'm going to read that again. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love if you you missed my greeting this morning let me again greet those who are joining us from zoom facebook and youtube we are fresh start ministries here in barbados beautiful island of barbados the land of sea and sun land of flying fish and cuckoo hallelujah we're so happy to be sharing god's word with you um last week we started a series on love and basically we did the introduction last week and we looked at the different greek words uh, being translated love hallelujah praise the lord so we're going to continue this week we're going to be looking at the virtues of love all right um part two all right and today's part two in the series we're going to be having a, a number of parts to this series we're going to take it slowly and we're going to look at love in depth praise the lord see what god's word has to say about love all right so we just read first john 4 verse 7 and 8 and we also want to read uh first corinthians chapter 13 we call that the love chapter first corinthians chapter 13 i'm going to read all of it praise the lord it says though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels i have not charity i am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, I have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Where there be prophecies, they shall fail. Where there be tongues, they shall cease. Where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And I was a child, I spake as a child, they understood as a child, 
I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. We want to give you praise, honor, and glory. Father, we love you. Hallelujah. From the depths of our hearts. And we know you love us. For you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. He took our place. We were the ones that were supposed to be on that cross. But by your love, by your mercy, and by your grace, you've sanctified us. You've washed us. You've made us clean that we can stand holy and unblameable and unreprovable in your sight. That we may be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. We want to thank you for your love that has been shed abroad, poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Giving us the ability to love everyone, even the unlovable, even our enemies, Father. We want to thank you for this divine love, for this agape love, Lord. Help us to walk in love towards our fellow man. Hallelujah. Help us to walk in love, O oh God, towards everyone, Father, including those that hate us, those that persecute us, those that despitefully use us, Lord. Help us to walk in love and never give up on people, O oh God. O oh God, but, but, but wait to see a change in them. Love them until we see a change in them in the name of Jesus because we know that Christ loved us even when we were estranged from him. Lord, when we were separated from him, when we did not even have Christ in our minds, he had us in his mind and he went to that cross for us. And we want to thank him. We want to thank you, Father, for this salvation, this no soul salvation. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for sanctifying us. Thank you for adopting us into the family of God. It's all because of your love because of your grace, because of your mercy or compassion. Dear God, we say thanks to you. We say thanks to you. I know we ask you to unveil your word to our hearts. Oh God, I pray that you would grant me clarity of speech, that as I speak the oracles of God, your word will go forth with power and the anointing, Lord, and transform lives. Oh God, may we never be the same again, Father. And may you receive all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. And Lord, at the end of this message, we pray that souls, O oh God, anxious penitents, O oh God, would come to the foot of the cross and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. That every sick person that's hearing my voice will be healed. And every person that is bound will be delivered in the name of Jesus. And Father, we say thanks. Hallelujah. We say praise the Lord. We say glory to God. Have your way today, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, so we want to say God is good. He is wonderful. He is great. He is mighty to save and strong to deliver. I just want to recap a bit of what I said last week concerning love. We said that there's so much confusion in the world today because of a lack of love. I said that every step outside of love is sin. We talk about do's and don'ts, abiding by do's and don'ts. Don't do this. Don't handle this. Don't drink this. Don't eat this, you know. But once we walk in love, the Bible says love is the fulfillment of the law. Once we walk in love, every step outside of love is sin. So what do we do? We try our utmost best by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in love. And if we want to measure our love lives, we need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So then, we said that the Greek is the strongest language there is on earth. We said the Greeks say exactly what they mean. You know, um, we talk about love. You know, we, we say, I love my wife, 
you know, oh, I love my husband. But then we say, I love my car, I love my dog, I love my horse. Then we say, oh, I love that lovely sunset. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love this piece of jewelry. Everything is love, 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 love. I love my mother. I love my father. But of course, you don't love your parents the same way you love your wife. It's a different type of love. You don't love a dog the same way you love um, your wife or your, your parents. It's a different type of love. But in English, we use the word love, <laughs> you know, love, 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 love. Of course, you know, according to the context, I would understand what you mean. I, I would know that you want to love your dog the same way you love your mother or your father. All right? It depends on the context. But the Greeks say exactly what they mean. All right? And we said there are four, basically four Greek words in the Bible translated love. We have the eros type of love, which is a, a sexual or passionate type of love. Um, yes, it's, in, it's needed in a, in a relationship, husband and wife um, relationship because it's based on the feelings, it's based on the emotions, and it involves being attracted to um, your partner, and and uh, you know, and it's all right in a relationship, all right, to a certain extent. If you are married, well, it's all well and good. Um, in a courtship, um, you know, we 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 yes, this type of love uh, can be. Um, you know, it's prevalent because it's present because, as I said, it involves the emotions and attraction and things like that. But when it's pushed too far and you you start gratifying the flesh, you know, getting involved in um, sexual activity, which the Bible forbids, then it becomes um, lust. All right, but it's, it's it's okay in a marriage relationship. But we said it's not enough to sustain a marriage because it is based on the feelings and the emotions. And then when the feelings are not there, what happens? The love dies. All right, it dissipates. It disappears. All right, when the wife starts to put on some size after the first baby, and, and she becomes a bit uh unshapely or whatever she doesn't have that court bottle figure <laughs> that she had when y'all uh, first were married you know and you know if, if she doesn't appeal to you like she did before what will happen is that those feelings will subside you know and then you might find someone else to gratify your flesh so that's not enough to sustain a relationship as i said it's all well and good the marriage is needed in marriage that chemistry is needed that a you know attraction is needed uh, no, those physical feelings are needed but it's not enough to keep a marriage then we talk about the filial type of love it represents tender affection love between friends best friends and brethren you know it's the highest type of love the world knew prior to the advent of christ all right um, but again this is the love that was based on the law an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth um you, you we are be best friends until you match my corns all right we are best friends until you offend me all right if you poke out my eye i poke your eyes out too <laughs> all right it's a love that's based on revenge eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth all right but again this is not enough to sustain a friendship because this type of love crumbles under pressure but it's the highest type of love the world knew prior to the advent of, of christ all right and then we have the sturgio love all right sturgio another greek word this kind of love exists between family members love for your mother love for your father love for your aunt uncle brothers sisters you know that that type of love love that exists among family but then we talk about the agape type of love this is the type of love that jesus introduced to the world all right it's called the god kind of love all right the agape love or agape your love all right and um, use them uh, interchangeably all right this is the type of love that jesus brought into the world it's a love that loves in spite of in spite of your class in spite of your color in spite of your creed in spite of your disposition uh, in spite of your beliefs, all right, this is the love that love in spite of. I had you say last week, uh, I had you repeat after me, I'm going to ask you to do it again. Uh, this morning, there is nothing that I can do to cause God to love me more. And there is nothing that I can do to cause God to love me less. God just loves you in spite. It doesn't matter how good you are or how evil you are. It doesn't matter if you're a God worshiper or if you're a devil worshiper. 
God just loves you in spite of. Hallelujah. He loves every single one. And the Bible says he is not willing that any man perish, but that all come to repentance. He says he is not um, he's willing that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So despite who you are, God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about that. He just loves you in spite of, hallelujah, your condition, your situation. He just loves you. So we thank God for that type of love. It's the same love that God had for his son or has for his son, Jesus Christ. The same love, the same God kind of love. Because Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer that that same love that God had for him or has for him would be in us. Hallelujah. It's the same love. Praise the Lord. And Romans chapter 5, verse 5 tells us that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we have the ability to love. We have the ability to love. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because that love is in our hearts. Glory to God. So we want to continue today. We're going to look at the virtues of love. And when we say the virtues of love, um, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm going to read it. For it says, love suffereth long. All right. Love is kind. All right. Um, let me let me let me go. Let me read them again. Um <laughs> and your sight is so hallelujah let me, let me read it right love suffereth long and is kind charity endeth not charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked thinketh no evil rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth beareth all things believeth all things hope of all things endureth all things we're going to be looking at these things um, in detail this these virtues in detail um, this morning so I want you to follow me praise the Lord but before we go into the virtues let's let's look at verse one hallelujah the apostle said by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass and a tingling cymbal. Let's, let's pause here for a moment. The Bible speaks of the importance of tongues. But it says, when I speak in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. My spirit is praying, but my understanding is unfruitful or bears no fruit. In other words, your spirit is in direct contact with God and your spirit is the main part of you. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless on the coming of the Lord. Man is a three-dimensional being. He has a spirit. Sorry, he is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. When God created man, his own, his own image, but it says God formed man from the dust of the ground. So man was just a mole. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The same Hebrew word translated breath is also translated spirit. Spirit, excuse me. Uh, and, and then when the spirit entered the body, then man became a living soul. All right. So God put spirit within that lifeless body, within that mole. And when that spirit came in contact with the body, then man became a living soul. With your spirit, you contact God. But we said they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God made man his own image. God is a spirit. God made man his own likeness. God is a spirit. So man is a spirit being. All right. And then the Bible says that, but you, you know, of course, that the body is that outer part that you can see, the house of your spirit. But then what is the soul? So the body is that physical part of you. The, the spirit is that spiritual part of you that is like God. All right. So then what is the soul? The soul is your natural life. The soul is your 
your is made up of comprised of the mind and the five senses your emotions is where you have your powers of volition or your powers of choice make you where, you where you make your own choices your your own mind your own will all right god did not make you like a robot yes he made you a spirit being in spirit you are like god all right and and you live in a body but god does not did not make you like a robot that when he push a button you have to go left or go right you know god allows you to make choices he's giving you that power of volition that power of choice all right so we choose right or wrong we choose left or right we choose up or down we make choices we decide whether we're going to serve god or not all right so it says when you pray in an unknown tongue your spirit all right which is made in the image of god your spirit prays but your mind is unfruitful or your mind bears no fruit. Your mind is unproductive. Your mind is unproductive. In other words, the mind does not understand what you're saying. Why? Because the Bible says that when you pray in an unknown tongue, you pray by the Holy Spirit within you. This Holy Spirit gives you the utterance. So you're really praying perfect prayer. It's not subject to any human limitations. All right, it's not subject to doubt or, or mistakes or anything like that because the Holy Spirit in you, as the Bible says, is giving the utterance and they're speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So, he that's speaking of known tongue, all right, as I said, um, his spirit is praying, but his mind is unfruitful. So, that's the best way to pray. Secondly, it says that when you speak in an unknown tongue, you speak unto God and not to men. Your prayer is directed to God because man does not understand you. It's the Holy Spirit leading your spirit to pray, giving you the utterance in tongues. And you're praying directly to God and God understands that language. So we see the importance of speaking in tongues. He said, but we'll also say, he that speaks in unknown tongue edifies himself or builds up himself. Uh, one other um, one one Greek scholar said that we have a word in our English uh, vernacular that um, that closely translates the word for build up, it, it, and, and he uses that word charge. He that speaks on tongue charges himself like a battery. All right. So speaking in tongues is so important, but the Bible says that though you speak in tongues. Tongues of men and tongues of angels, and you don't have love, you are like a symbol. Just a lot of noise, but dead. No life. That is serious. So you see how important love is. You can speak in tongues for no other more. If you don't walk in love, you're simply living in sin. Because every step outside of love is sin. So do I speak of the tongues of men? And of angels that have not charged them become the sounding brass and think the symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery, the Bible speaks about prophecy. Hmm? He says that he that prophesies edifies or builds up the church. And then Paul encourages in 1 Corinthians 14, encourages the church to prophesy one by one. Hmm? He says, he that prophesies Prophesieth is greater than him that speak in tongues unless he interpret. So tongues plus interpretation is equivalent to prophecy. But it says he that prophesieth is greater than him that speak in tongues. Then the Bible tells us covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues. Covet to prophesy, earnestly desire to prophesy. So prophecy is very, very important in the church. But... And the Bible says, if you prophesy mm, and you understand all mysteries and if you have all knowledge and do I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, look at that. The huh? Bible says concerning faith, that if you say, I speak on this mountain and command it to be removed and do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say. So even... If you have enough faith that you can remove the largest mountain and you don't have love, he says what? He says, you are nothing. I am nothing. 
So again, love is above all else. This God kind of love that is enough to sustain every relationship, whether it be a marriage, whether it be relationship among your your peers, whether it be relationship in your family. This type of love, that love in spite of the class, your creed, your the condition, the situation, uh, your beliefs, your 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 your, your ethnicity, your race. What this type of love is prevalent in any relationship? That relationship would hold up. Hallelujah. Because you refuse to hate anyone. You just allow the love of God to emanate from your heart. Hallelujah. Despite. The behavior of the other person. That might seem difficult to do. Yes, in the flesh it's very, very, very difficult to do. There are people that have done us some terrible things. There's some people that have hurt us. There's some people that have betrayed us. And trust me, we've hurt people too. Don't act so sanctimonious because we, 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 we didn't walk in. In fact, we don't walk in perfect love. We've hurt, it. We've hurt people too. We've, we've offended people too. We've done wrong too. We've sinned against God too. He continues to love us. He continues to love us despite our failures, despite our character flaws, despite our weaknesses. God continues to love us. And His love is at one level. It can get greater. It can get lesser. No. God loves us in spite of. He is a good God. He is a wonderful God. So we understand then that love is the key. Love is the key. Now this chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is this love in its this is love in its perfection. First Corinthians chapter 13 is love in its perfection. This is the character of God, the character of Christ, the character of the Holy Spirit. We are aiming to exhibit or manifest this perfect love but as humans we fall short but this is the christian standard the measuring stick we gauge our love walk our christian behavior by this chapter every step outside of love is sin i'm gonna say that again every step outside of love is sin when you walk in love, you don't have to worry about do's and don'ts. Once you walk in love, the Bible says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. That's what the Bible says. If you walk in love, you won't do anything to harm anybody. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love yourself first, because if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. But the same way you would want to be treated, you would treat others. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you live by that golden rule, uh, you won't have any, any, any problem. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you don't want somebody to do something to you, but you don't do it to anybody either. Simple rule. And it's biblical. So we're just going to look at two virtues of love this morning. Love suffereth long. And love is kind. Love suffereth long. What does that mean? Love is long suffering. The Bible says that of God, that God is long suffering. I quoted one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Psalm 145, verse 7 and verse 8. 
It says the Lord is gracious. He is disposed to show favors. He is full of compassion. He is slow to anger. <laughs> so I think God's up there with a sledgehammer ready to, ready, ready to club you in the head when you make a mistake. I know when you read the Old Testament, it would appear as though God is, is, is some cruel taskmaster. And, and, and some of the Old Testament saints make it look as though God was that type of person. But if you really want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He's the perfect example of who God is like. In Jesus' ministry, he was moved with compassion. Jesus never walked about, um, you know, exposing people's faults and things like that. He just met people felt need, whether they followed him or not. Whether they loved him or not, he just met people's felt need. He was moved by faith, the faith of the people. He never asked them, are you, are you serving God? Are you living right? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Some people he healed. He, 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 he even told them, don't, don't, don't tell nobody here. Keep it a secret between us. Huh? You know, the only people that Jesus was harsh with were the Pharisees. Who, who were so far they couldn't see. The Pharisees. This was supposed to be the most religious sect of that day. But the Pharisees were hypocrites. And my definition of a hypocrite is one who not only pretends to be who they are not. Eh? But one who pretends to be who they are not and condemn others. And the Pharisees were like that. No, their hearts were not right with God, but yet still they want to condemn other people, point out other people's faults. That's why, that's why Jesus dealt, look how Jesus dealt with a woman who was taken in adultery. Jesus did not tell her, oh, you dirty woman. Yes, you deserve to be stoned. Huh? Yes, you were caught in the very act. You are guilty. No, Jesus didn't do that to the woman. Jesus, Bible says he spat and he wrote on the ground. And God knows what he wrote. But I believe he wrote things like lying, cheating, a whole lot of other sins. And when the accusers looked at what Jesus wrote, all of them were guilty in heart. Because they were guilty of something that Christ, Christ wrote on the ground. And they were not able to stone the woman because they themselves will have to be stoned also. All right. So Jesus asked, woman, where are your accusers? He said, Lord, I have none. He said, well, go and sin no more. When Jesus met the adulterous woman at the well who had five husbands and said the one that she had was not her own. She was living in a relationship with a married man. Jesus didn't condemn her. But Jesus spoke to her about the living water. No, he never encouraged people in, in, in sin. No, he didn't. All right. But he was compassionate. He was loving. Huh? You know, if you want to know what God is like, you need to look at Jesus Christ. He is, he is the will of God. Was, when he was on earth, he was the will of God in action. In fact, he was God, the embodiment of God. God in a human body. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Huh? David, on the old covenant, was the one that came closest to the heart of God. Uh, he manifests God's love and God's compassion. You see? So the Bible says, God, um, the first man chapter 30 says, love suffers long. Love is long suffering. Oh, just quote here that. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't finish quote, quote that, um, that scripture in Psalm 145, verse 7 and 8. The Lord is gracious, me, he's disposed to show favors. He is full of compassion. He is slow to anger, he just elaborated on that, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Not some, his tender mercies are over all his works. All, 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 all means all. His tender mercies are over all his works. The same word translated mercy, the same Greek, uh, Hebrew word translated mercy is also translated compassion. He has compassion on all his works. The word compassion means to love tenderly, to love eagerly, to pity, to show mercy. That's what the word compassion means. God's a God of compassion. He's a God of long suffering. What does it mean when they say love suffers long? It means that love can endure evil and provocation without being filled with resentment or revenge. 
Love does not take revenge. Love does not get back at people who have wronged us. I know how many of you watch uh, martial arts movies. Those are among my favorites. But those of you who watch martial arts, there is one word you always hear in martial arts movies. Can you tell me what it is? Yes, you're right. Revenge. I must take revenge. I must take revenge. We have to take revenge. You hear that word over and over and over in martial arts movies. Love does not take revenge. Love is not vengeful. God says, vengeance is, uh, vengeance is his. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repair. Vengeance belongs to God, not to us. So love can endure evil and provocation without being filled with resentment and revenge. It doesn't matter how many times people provoke us. It doesn't matter how many times they pressure us. It doesn't matter how much evil they have done to us, how malicious they have been. It does not matter. Love is not filled with revenge. You continue to love the person who offends you, who hurts you, who betrays you. You come to love them. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that you're to stay in an abusive relationship? No. I told you last week, be wise as a serpent and be harmless as a dove. In wisdom, you would have to separate yourself from an abusive person for your own protection. You use wisdom. But doesn't, that doesn't mean you are to stop loving the person. While you are separate from them, you're praying to God that a change would come about in their lives. You continue to love them. Yes, your flesh is going to be angry. Yes, you're going to be angry in your flesh. Yes, you're going to be angry in your mind. Yes, you're going to be hurt emotionally, but deep down inside, in your spirit, you should allow God's love to emanate from your life, from your heart. This is not a fleshy thing. This is a spiritual thing. You love them from your heart and you continue to pray that God would effect change in their lives. You see, many walk in the flesh. And that's why, you know, very often things don't work out for us because we go according to how we feel. But we are not moved by what we feel. We are moved by what God's word says. God says to love. Look how many times we offend God. Look how many years we spent outside the kingdom of God doing what we like in the world. And God still loves us. Even before we were born, Christ shed his blood on that cross for us. God knew every sin that we would have committed. And he knows every sin that we're going to commit in the future. But the blood has already been shed. Christ already paid for every single sin that you committed and that you will ever commit. That is love. And the same way God was merciful and compassionate to you, we ought to be merciful and compassionate where others are concerned. Love suffers long. It can endure evil and provocation without being filled with resentment or revenge. We don't hate people. No. So I said you may have to separate from that abusive husband or that abusive wife. You're not going to stay let them beat you all the time. No, you separate. But though you're angry in the flesh, but we still be angry and sin not, you still pray that God will change that individual. There's some people you just can't reconcile to. And that is all. When I say reconcile to you, you may not be able to continue in the marriage, but that does not mean you have to hate the person. You can still walk in divine love. If the person needs help, huh? and you can't go yourself, but they said, well, you've got to protect yourself, be wise as a serpent, protecting yourself, but don't do anything to harm the person. Be harmless as a dove. If you can't go yourself, you will send help by somebody else. You know, you'll still get your reward because you're protecting yourself. But you send help. You walk in love. Love will put up with the many slights from the person it's, it loves. 
and let's long to see the kindly effects of such patience on the individual. Love does not give up on people. You don't write off people. That is not love. God doesn't write off anybody. But it says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. When God gives somebody a gift, God expects them. Hallelujah. Or when God calls someone to a ministry, he expects them to fulfill that ministry. It doesn't matter how many times they fall. It doesn't count how many times you fall. It counts how many times you get back up. Yeah, you might lose some respect or whatever. God still expects you to, 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 to fulfill that call. If he calls you to preach the gospel, he still expects you to preach the gospel. He does not take back a call. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He does not take back a call. And there are many who have been hurt in the body of Christ. Many people who were called to ministry, but because they're messed up. And the church treated them so badly. The church hurt them so badly. Treat them like outcasts, outcast, ostracize them. And because of that, they're out of ministry today. Because we have not learned how to walk in love. We push this thing, discipline, to the extreme. To, to we hurt people. Discipline is about... Um, restoration, giving the person a time to reflect and, and whatever. Uh, we, we, we got this thing where we, we just because somebody sinned, a, a young girl messed up or something, let's say she was a Christian doing well in church, she became pregnant. Uh, we stop her from taking a communion. Who are, who are we to stop a person from partaking of the body of Christ once the person has repented? Of course, if the person has an office in the church, you would give them a period of, of, of discipline. You know, you might, you might, um, you you might, you know, um, relieve the person of their duties for a little while while they reflect and while you you help to restore and encourage. We can understand that, but we have no right to stop somebody from partaking in the Lord's supper once that person has been repentant. They have a right to partake in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. So because that person has sinned now, uh, they become an outcast. Once they've repented, if you're convinced they've repented, we should not stop anyone from partaking in the Lord's Supper. I don't think that is right. Some may not agree with me, but I don't think that that is right. Every Christian, because a person sinned, it does not mean they're not a Christian. It does not mean he or she is not a Christian. No. But I've heard of, 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 of ministers allowing the people to come to the communion table, but then passing the cup and the bread over their heads when they reach out to take it. That is so embarrassing. One pastor I have in mind that did that to someone. These are some ridiculous things that we do in the body of Christ. As I said, some might not agree with me, but I believe I'm right. I believe I'm speaking by the Spirit of God. That we have no right to stop a repentant person from partaking in the Lord's Supper. And that the communion table, you're given a chance to reflect on your life. But we tell, look at your life. Huh? Do some introspection while you're at the communion table. And if you've committed your sin, ask God to forgive you. Love suffers long. Love is patient. It will put up with the many slights from the person it loves and waits long to see the kindly effects of such patience on that individual. There's some people that can't bear criticisms. Uh, they can't bear persecutions. They can't bear mockings. Uh, can't bear being ridiculed. We're ready, some, some are ready to cuss and some are ready to carry on. Some are ready to tell off and, you know, so, so quick. Huh? We take offense so easily. As someone said, an offense becomes an offense once it is taken. You can tell me from now to more that I'm ugly. It won't bother me because they don't receive it. So I won't be offended. But by the time I receive it now, <laughs> that's when I become offended. But I want to allow myself to become offended because I would not receive it. Why? And I don't believe it. People can think what they want to think. I know what I believe about me. So I won't become offended very easily. All right? But the Bible tells us to love everyone, even the unlovable. 
Love everyone. Love suffereth long. Love is patient. Love is long suffering. Love will put up with the many slights from the person it loves. And wait long. And wait long to see the kindly effect of such patience on the individual. We're going to read a few scriptures. Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and verse 45. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and verse 45. Listen to what Jesus said here. Verse 44. In fact, let's read from verse 43. You have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. <laughs> but I, Jesus, I, God in the flesh, I, the embodiment of God, say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So that what? That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. God's children act like him. God's children behave like him. God's children exemplifies him. God's children portray him. God's children exemplify or exemplify him. God's children portray him. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good. Hmm. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. No, he put evil first, the evil and the good. Hmm. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. My God. If God is good to those that are evil and those that are just, would he expect us to do less as his children? No. 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 Love can endure evil and provocation, but being filled with resentment or revenge. It will put up with the many slights from the person it loves and waits long to see the kindly effects of such patience on the individual. Wow. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn it with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to try to hurry through. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, we are reading verse... I'm not going to read all of it. Verse 7 to verse 18. It's going to read a few verses of it. I'm going to the 4 from verse 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the den of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Christ's sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. To a death workers in us, but life in us in you. In other words, Paul is talking about the, the trials and the testings and the, the beatings and all those things that, that they had to endure for the sake of the gospel. Why? He said that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in them. The life of Jesus. In other words, the love of Jesus. God's love for humanity. Jesus loved people. That's why he went to the cross because of love. It was love that took him to that cross. It was love. His love for you. He thought about you. He saw you being reconciled unto him. And that was the, jo that was the joy that was set before him. Mm? He despised the shame. Why? Because he was looking at you and me. 
being in his arms, being reconciled to him, serving him in spirit, serving God in spirit and in truth. It was love that nailed him to that cross. So Paul and those guys suffered so much persecution, pain, ridicule, beatings, all those things. They suffered uh, all for the sake of the gospel. Because they want to see, they want to see man reconciled unto God through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. So many other scriptures. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 20. Just going to read a few of them. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 20. 1 Timothy 3, verse 20. Let me Sorry, first, first Timothy, uh, well, second Timothy, sorry, second Timothy chapter three, verse 20. I missed it there. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 20. Mm, I'm missing something here. Oh man, second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. I got to change my glasses. <laughs> yeah. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. So once you call yourself a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, you will suffer persecution. You will suffer persecution. Second Corinthians, um, Second Corinthians chapter um, 11, verse 23. It says, are there ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I the more. In labors, more abundance. In stripes, above measures. In prisons, more frequent. In death, often. What was it that drove Paul to continue preaching despite his suffering, despite those beatings, despite those scourgings, and despite the, the, the ridicule and the insults and the stoning? What drove Paul to continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? It was that love. That love, that love. He could have thrown in the towel ever since and said, look, I'm tired of these people. They don't like me. They're not receiving my message. No, but Paul continued to preach the gospel because God's love constrained him. Hallelujah. The love of God. Love suffers all weakness, ignorance, errors, and infirmities of the children of God. And all malice and wickedness of the children of the world. And all this not only for a time but unto the end. Philippians 1 verse 29 says that all that live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. We tend to give up too easily. Love does not give up on people. Love does not. We ought to walk in divine life. And finally, love is kind. The law of kindness is in her lips. What does this mean, love is kind? Love seeks to be useful. Love does not only seize on opportunities of doing good, but love searches for them. Thank God for the opportunities of showing kindness. Thank God for every instance that presented itself to us where we can, could exhibit kindness. But love does not only grasp or see or seizes, does not only grasp or seize those opportunities. Love searches. In other words, even if an opportunity does not present itself, love would ask, is there anything that I can do for you? Is there any way in which I can help you? That is love. That is love. It searches for opportunities of doing good. It seeks to help others. Love seeks to be useful, not only sees the opportunities of doing good, but searches for them.
You know, that's why a lot of people don't get promotion on jobs, you know. They don't seek to be useful. Yeah, they might seize an opportunity of being kind or doing good, doing something for the boss, uh, even something that might be a little outside of, of, of their job description. But those that search for ways of doing good, just asking, is there anything that I can do? Is there anything I can help you with? Boss, is there anything that I can help you with? You might have done your, your, your daily tasks. You see, we're working on some project and you finish that project a little early. You just don't sit down and lap your foot. Boss, is there anything else that I can do with the limit the rest of the time that I have? You know, I had a brother who worked for the Costa. And he was well loved on the job. Because he used to help the boss do some stuff. Something helped the boss draft letters because my his boss recognized that he had that skill. He would help the boss draft letters. Huh? And times he would ask the boss, you know, is there anything that I can help you with? And because of that they had a good relationship. And I believe that if he had uh, remained in that company because he left to go overseas to, 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 to um, you know, he, take up, he took up residence in the United States. But I believe that he would have gone far on that job because of his attitude. He not only seized the uh, opportunities of, of doing good, but he searched for opportunities. You see, your attitude determines your altitude. There's some employees who give them something to do, they go and do it, and then they sit down. There are others who, after they've done what they were told to do, would go to the boss and say, is there anything else that I can do? Is there anything else I can, is there anything I can help you with? It's a difference, a difference in attitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. So what does it mean when I say love is kind? I mean, love seeks to be useful. Not only sees the opportunities of doing good, but searches for them. I'm going to read a few scriptures and then we're going to close. The book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, you know, sometimes when we don't reap the results of, 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 of our kindness instantaneously, we tend to give up. And I'm being too kind, and I'm not being rewarded for this. Look, payday is coming. It may not be tomorrow. May not be next week, may not be next month, may not be next year. But payday is coming. Bible says you will reap what you sow. Once you sow good seeds, good will come back to you. Might not be when you're looking for it, but it will be on time. Let's read again, um, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, if we don't give up. Once you continue doing good, once you continue being kind, you will reap one day once you don't give up. Don't become weary in well-doing. As we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men. Not just the good, but even the bad. Even your enemies. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Especially to your Christian brother. 
Let us do good to all men. Let's be kind to all men. There's a verse in the Bible that says, If your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall reap coals of fire upon his head. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read verse 20 and verse 21. Therefore, I just quoted it, but I'll read it. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. His conscience will bother him to see that he is so evil to you. And you are showing God's love, God's kindness towards him. Philippians 13, verse 10. Philippians or Romans? Sorry, Romans 13, Romans 13, verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. You see, every step outside of love is sin. The law says, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Well, you don't have to abide by do's and don'ts. Once you walk in love, there's certain things you just won't do because love is fulfilling the law. So, as I said, this chapter depicts the character of Christ. It portrays the character of Christ. Love in its perfection. It is true that we do not live this 100% because as humans we do err. But God has given us the ability to love everyone, even the unlovable, even our enemies. And every time, and, and, and ever so often we need to come back to this chapter and measure our lives against this chapter. Let this chapter be our gauge. This will tell us exactly how our love walk is. Whenever you come back to this, you'll see where you've missed it, where you faltered, and you'll bring yourself back in line with God's word. God wants us to walk in love. Walk in love. Walk in love. Your flesh might not want to do it. Huh? Because the flesh is always trying to get the ascendancy. That flesh is the old you that was pushed on the outside when Christ came in. That old you became the flesh. But that old you is always trying to have the ascendancy. Always trying to gain control again. Want you to behave, you know, like how you did before you were a Christian. But no, God's love constrains us. God's love keeps us in check. And we ought to walk according to our spirits and not according to the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. We ought to let love dominate. We ought to let love rule. We ought to let the spirit, man, that has the Holy Spirit in him, the spirit, man, into whom God's love was poured out or shed abroad. We ought to let that inner man, the hidden man of the heart, the spirit, the real you that is made in the image and the likeness of God, where the Holy Spirit dwells, we ought to allow that inner man to dominate. We ought to walk in this agape, this divine love. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today for your word. Again, we thank you for the ability to walk in love. Thank you for the love that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that we can love the unlovable, that we can love our enemies. We can love those that persecute us and despitefully use us we can love those that hate us we can love those that 
are mischievous towards us. Lord, we thank you for that ability to love. Help us not to give up on people, but help us, O oh God, to love them in spite of, in spite of their class, their creed, their disposition, their race, their ethnicity, their condition, their beliefs. Oh God, help us to love them, to show God's love. Even when we have to rebuke, Lord, at the end of the day, Lord, we pray that even through this rebuke, that they will understand that we love them. Even when it comes to chastening our children, may they understand that we chasten them because we love them, because you chasten us when we sin. But you chasten us because we are children, and because you love us, and you want us to do better. You want us to do well, and that's why you chasten us. Even those, O oh God, who experience church discipline, I pray, O oh God, that they may understand, O oh God, that this is done in love to help them, O oh God, get back on their feet and walk the straight and narrow way. Lord, we want to thank you. Lord, we want to praise you. O oh Father, we commit our tongues into your hands because you said the tongue can no man tame. It's unruly evil. It is full of deadly poison. Lord, we trust you to help us to control our words, oh God. Oh God, we, we ask you to direct what we say, oh God. Help us to be kind, oh God, in our words. And that even if we have to rebuke, oh God, it may be seen that we care. Hallelujah. And that your love, oh God, is emanating from our lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So, Father... We commit the rest of this day into your hands. And Lord, we ask you for your divine protection. Oh God, help us to tell someone about Christ. May our life exemplify Christ. Father, they may see, oh God, oh God, our good works and glorify you who is in heaven. Hallelujah. May our lights continue to shine, Lord, to burn brightly in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we pray for those who are sick. Satan, we command you to take your hands off their bodies right now. We come against every sickness and disease. We speak to every condition right now. We speak the word of healing. By your stripes ye are healed. By your stripes ye were healed. Himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Yes, Lord, we speak to every disease right now. Hallelujah. Be healed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Every individual be healed right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your healing power now surge through their bodies, Lord. Drive it now, every sickness and every disease in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for every abnormality, every deformity. We speak, oh God, health to their bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for the working of miracles even now in the name of Jesus Christ. That every crooked part of the body will be made straight. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every missing part we replace right now. In the name of Jesus. Every damaged part, oh God, will be healed. Straighten whatever needs to be done. Oh God, that that body would function. The way it has been created to function. In the name of Jesus. And every part of that body would work correctly. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we pray for those who have financial needs. Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus uh, that you would supply all they need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray you, so you would stir, oh God, their hearts. Lord, that you would become givers, oh God, to your work. For you said, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken again, and running over. You shall cause men to give in to our bosom. So I pray they will become givers, oh God. It was so seeds into your work. Hallelujah. And that they would prosper and be in health, even as their soul prospers in the name of Jesus. Everyone that is bound, oh God, who are experiencing sleepless nights, oh God. Those who are bound by alcohol and drugs, those who are bound by demonic spirits, in the name of Jesus, we loose them. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And we want to give you thanks and praise right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to invite those of you who don't know Christ to receive him as your personal and indwelling Savior. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that he that comes to God, he would in no wise cast out. 
say, the Bible says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. So I want to invite you, hallelujah, today to give your heart to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as you say, want to say this prayer after me. Oh, Lord God, I come into your presence. I acknowledge that you are God. I also acknowledge that I am a sinner and I am in need of salvation. I believe in my heart that you raised Christ from the dead. And I confess him with my mouth as my Lord and Savior. I renounce sin. I renounce the devil. I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the miracle of salvation in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I believe you just got born again. You've just become a member of the family of God. I want to welcome you on behalf of the body of Christ. I want to welcome you into the family of God. I want to encourage you to go to a Bible believing church. Hallelujah. Where you'll be taught the gospel of Christ. Where you'll meet fellow believers who will befriend you. Who will help to nurture you. Who will help you to grow in Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Do this as soon as possible. We are Fresh Start Ministries International. We're located um, um, at the Grantly Prescott Memorial Primary School. Um, St. Barnabas Road. St. Michael Barbados. Hallelujah. You can contact me at 230-1509. For those outside of Barbados. Our area code is 246. The number is one 246 Two three zero one five zero nine. Hallelujah! If you've received healing, deliverance, you can um, contact me. Hallelujah! Via WhatsApp. Um, the number is two four nine three eight three four. Or for those outside of Barbados, one two four six two four nine three eight three four. Let us know what Christ has done in your life. Um, you know. Um, through these meetings hallelujah in the name of jesus of course we'll publish your testimonies and if you don't want us to publish your name that's all right all right we respect people's privacy but um you know we would want people to know what god is doing through his word hallelujah praise the lord so i'll be uh, just let you know that very soon we are going to be um starting a, a healing school um online healing school it's called christ the healer healing school christ the healer healing school praise the lord this is an online school where we're going to be teaching the word concerning prayer healing um deliverance um faith and of course salvation and we cannot touch on healing unless we um, include things like compassion, mercy, and grace. So this is going to be in-depth teaching, all right, from the Word of God. And our aim is to, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to get you delivered, get those of you who are sick or bound to be delivered. We want to encourage you to put God's Word first. God's Word always works. God's Word is already anointed so we can be teaching the word of god and once you apply the word of god once you appropriate the word of god to your hearts um it would affect change in your life hallelujah praise the lord so christ the healer healing school also we're going to allow you to um, pose questions things that you might not understand you might want some clarification again you can use that whatsapp number one two four six um, 249-3834 you can use that number to um, pose your questions if we are on zoom you can ask your question right there on, on zoom and i would try to answer the questions as best as i could by the empowerment of the holy spirit as the holy spirit guides i don't know everything i'm still learning you know but you know if i you know if i don't have the answer to a question i have some wonderful colleagues out there who i can 
address the questions to and you know and then get back to you or would or we do my research all right i don't claim to know everything but I thank god for what little i know and what little i can share with you so christ the healer um healing school we also want to be praying for the sick online all right i'm praying f you know against your ailments the sicknesses and your diseases praying um for deliverance praying for financial breakthroughs we're going to be praying for you also so very shortly we're going to announce our beginning date and we would want you to join us via zoom via facebook via youtube all uh, for these powerful sessions praise the name of the lord well um bishop cameron nichols i preach myself happy this morning as usual i'll be getting i'll be coming back again next week to continue on the virtues of love praise the lord i i pray god that you've been enjoying these sessions and that you are determined you, you are you endeavored in your heart to walk in this divine love for love is the fulfillment of the law and love is the basis for all christian activity in the body of christ so this is bishop Cameron nichols signing out god bless you god bless you god bless you have a wonderful day in Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.